So if you are telling your kids, don't think about sex, don't don't talk about sex. If somebody talks to you about it at school, like, you know, shaming them for even like listening to the conversation, what we're telling them is that we don't accept this conversation in our home. We're not going to talk about it. And when kids are curious, they're just going to go elsewhere for that information. And it's just always going to be a more dangerous situation. Like, wouldn't you rather your child be able to ask you? Many people want to navigate life with peace and joy, but struggle to connect to their intuition. They find themselves overwhelmed, burned out, and frustrated. My name is Francesca Phillips, and I'm obsessed with spirituality and psychology and how the two can intersect to help you live a successful and intuitive life. I believe each of us can accomplish amazing things through balance and healthy habits instead of burnout. Consider this your go-to resource for where spiritual wellness and mindful productivity meets practical wisdom. If you're craving positivity and want to know how to find the answers within, instead of searching endlessly without, then you're in the right place. Get ready to feel supported and inspired. This is the Good Space Podcast. You're listening to the Good Space Podcast, episode number 54, Sex Positivity, Why Learning to Set Boundaries and Sex Education Matters with Rosalia Rivera. Before we dive in, I want to give my warm appreciation to our reviewer of the week, Patrick MC, and they say, insightful and needed more now than ever. Patrick MC, thank you. Thank you for your review. I'm glad our episodes are interesting and that you are learning so much from them. Please let us know if you have any specific topics you want us to cover. And again, thank you so much for listening. If you want to be highlighted in an upcoming episode and help further the mission of The Good Space, make sure to subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts so I can then highlight your review in an upcoming episode. It only takes a minute. You can pause the episode and come right back. Make sure to screenshot this episode on your phone and tag us on your Instagram story at findyourgoodspace, hashtag the good space, to let me know that you're joining in today, as you know that I love to share those screenshots on our stories too. Welcome to the Good Space Podcast. Today, we are going to speak with a very special guest, Rosalia Rivera. She is someone who helps busy parents go from fearful and anxious to confident and empowered about teaching their kids about body safety, boundaries, and consent to prevent sexual abuse. Rosalia is a consent educator, abuse prevention specialist, sexual literacy advocate, speaker, change agent, and the founder of Consent Parenting. She is the host of the About Consent podcast and creator of Consentware. Rosalia teaches parents, particularly child sexual abuse survivors, how to educate their children on body safety, boundaries, and consent so that they can empower their families to prevent abuse and break intergenerational cycles. Rosalia is on a mission to end child sexual abuse, dismantle shame, and help survivors heal and become thrivers. She's certified through the Canadian Center for Child Protection's Commit to Kids program and Darkness to Light Stewards of Children program, as well as the Human Trafficking Prevention Training Program on Watch by Safe House Project. Although Rosalia was born in El Salvador and grew up in New York, she now resides in Northern Canada with her partner and three young kids. Rosalia, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. That's a, a mouthful of an intro. <laughs> it really tells me that you know what you're doing and that you know how to speak on this topic. So I felt it was important to include that so that anyone listening knows, okay, what you're about to say is like, you're going to know how to answer my questions. I'm really excited to dive into it. And, you know, today I was thinking, although we might not focus solely on kids, that is going to be a part of it because we all were kids once and we all have kids in our lives um, and so I'm, yeah, excited to dive into this topic with you. And um, before we do, though, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you decided to do this important work? Sure. I actually, um, it was such a winding road. I'm not going to make you go through that whole process of uh, explaining how I got to here. But I actually have a background in um, photography and marketing um, that was what I did for uh, close to 18 years before I started doing this work. Um, but this is funny enough, the work that I kept trying to do throughout that time and just hadn't really figured out what it was that, you know, how it was that I could work with survivors, be, being a survivor myself, and really having that at, at the heart of what I really wanted to do in my life at some point, somehow, I just didn't know exactly how. And then I had kids. 
And that was like, it was sort of the universe saying, okay, now you're ready to have these conversations because you're going to be having them in your own life. And I realized when my uh, oldest child, who's now almost 10, so when he was five, about five years ago, I realized that I was very ill-equipped to educate him on abuse prevention. And I was like gripped and riddled with anxiety about how to do that because I was never taught that. Um, my mom's a survivor. My sister's a survivor. So this was this is something that was very personal to me to make sure that I educated my children, but I just didn't know how. And then I started educating myself so that I could teach them and found myself getting very triggered. So I went from like anxiety to triggers, all the while realizing that this is such critically important work to be doing with my kids, but not having like the skill set to do it. And also the tools to navigate that very triggering process. When I finally decided like, I have to step into my own healing journey to be able to do this. I got the tools that I needed. I started, you know, working with a, a therapist and a hypno hypnotherapist and focusing on my healing, but also simultaneously educating myself, really determined to break this cycle. You know, it, it happened to my mom, it happened to my sister, it happened to me. I was not going to let it happen to my family. And so I, you know, took this very bold decision of this is really the work that I need to be doing and how to help other parents do it who are survivors as well, because my mom couldn't teach me because she just was also triggered and didn't have the tools. And I very passionately went into this and started seeing the transformation in my kids. That was when I was like, okay, I have to like share this with other parents. And ever since then, I've been really looking at how to innovate on what's already out there because there's all of this sort of really great information of, you know, create a safety network, talk to your, to your kids about these things. And the information is great, but the practicality of teaching it is like a whole other ball of wax, right? And so I wanted to create programs and tools that will help make it so much easier for parents that it's almost like you can't, you don't have an excuse to not do it now, you know, and, and to make it less triggering. And so that's how, you know, Consent Parenting was born. And then the podcast um, was really just a natural extension of saying like, you know, we, we need to have these conversations around healing in order to do this really important work. If we really want to prevent the next wave of Me Too, both for children as well as for adults. And so that's, you know, what, what led to that and eventually, you know, consent wear and things like that. So that's how I got here. That's great. And I think it's incredible that having gone through abuse yourself, that you have been able to not only know your worth and, and move forward in life and, and be a, you know, understand, cause I'm sure, cause I'm just thinking if I was a kid, you, at the moment, you don't, you probably don't understand the extent of what's happening or like the whole picture. Cause you just don't have the ability to like understand it. So I can imagine it must feel like, Oh, it's my fault. Or maybe this isn't wrong or like all these things. So like, how do you even begin to process that for yourself? Like, how did you go from having that experience to taking back your strength and your uh, worth essentially, or the ownership of who you are? And then now to teaching your kids, like, I, I want to hear more about that. Trauma is experienced by everyone very differently. For me, I was fortunate that I had a lot of suppressed memories. So there's a lot that I don't remember, but I do remember specifically critical pieces of, of what happened to me that helped me to understand like this, this did happen. This, this is an experience that I went through. And then understanding that I am no longer that child. A lot of it was just a reclamation of power. It was realizing that that child is someone that I can care for now and is no longer in danger. And I can take the steps that I need to, um, to learn how to set boundaries. I think when we as adults realize that we can set boundaries, it's an incredibly empowering experience. And what I found through the process of teaching my kids was that I had to learn how to develop better boundaries for myself first in order to really be able to teach them that and to model it, right? Because children learn so much more through modeling than even through our words. And when I took that shift in perspective of, 
wait, I am allowed to have boundaries and I do have the right to uphold them. And ultimately, you know, I'm the one that gets to parent my children, not my, you know, not my relatives, not my family members. Like a lot of times people feel resistance to setting boundaries because they were either never allowed to set them or if they set them, they were crossed consistently. And so we have to almost do a bit of reparenting for ourselves to go back and say, you know, I'm no longer that child. I can reclaim that power. I have the right to reclaim that power. And then once you do, you start to cultivate that sense of, you know, I own my body. I own my life. I own my rights and my voice matters. And here's how I'm going to use it. And then be able to share that with other, you know, with your family, your children to be able to empower them. But that takes also a support system. You can't always do that on your own. And I always advocate for people to seek whatever kind of support that is. Maybe right now it's just about getting your resiliency to be able to step into a healing journey and having support to build that resiliency. So I, you know, I'm always an advocate of coaches and mentors and therapists and healers, whoever it is that you need to be able to start at least looking at how to reclaim your power, right? Even just that idea of being curious about how you do that and starting to let that seed in your mind grow, I think is one of the first steps, but definitely seeking support to help you because no one can do this on their own. The more support that you have, the faster you can get to that place that you want to get to. So I feel very fortunate that I have a very supportive spouse. I was able to find, you know, a therapist that was right for me. I was able to build a, you know, a community of parents that were cheering on this message, you know, and realizing like, oh, they do really need this and they do really want this. And so, you know, finding community was really key as well. So I think those are the three things is like being willing to take a risk getting the support that you need to be, uh, you know, to have a net, right? Um, That's your support system. And then ultimately, like, once you step into that power, um, to be able to cultivate it, and then be able to teach it to your family. Earlier, when you said how, when the changes started happening within you, it affected your kids. And I'm assuming it's because of the boundaries, right? So when they saw you having boundaries, maybe they felt more empowered or they saw the difference in you. And it got me thinking about boundaries in general. And when it comes to sexual abuse or even just crossing someone's boundaries, like is, does it start at the emotional level? Like, cause I I'm thinking of empaths and that's been something that's on my mind is how like empathics pick up energy and they take responsibility for other people's emotions and energies and all that stuff. And so the way that they usually can stem that is by creating boundaries. First of all, how common is sexual abuse and how does it start? Does it start by people not having boundaries to begin with or like kids? Cause why would they have boundaries? They're just kids, but even adults, like, does it start with that person seeing I can cross, you know, align with this person and then it goes into like the physical stuff or like, how does that work? That's a great question. <laughs> and and it's, it's multi-layered. So I'll try to connect the dots as best as possible. To your question before, it is about adults learning how to vocalize their body boundaries there, you know, and boundaries are, they can happen in different ways. There's, you know, mental boundaries, physical boundaries, sexual boundaries, uh, spiritual boundaries, right? And we get to say what those boundaries are. And so when we're teaching that to kids, we need to know what those are for ourselves so we can give them examples, so we can show them what it sounds like to have a boundary, what it sounds like to uphold your boundary if someone tries to cross it. So when we have those, we can much more easily teach kids how to have their boundaries, right? So giving them language is key and we can't give them language if we don't have it or we don't use that language. So that's why I always say when when we're teaching kids about abuse prevention, it really starts with us understanding the facts. And so your other question was like, how prevalent is this? It is actually much more prevalent than people realize. And it, it it's almost um, maddening because it's such a silent epidemic, right? It's It's happening on such a massive level, but people don't talk about it because it feels like it's 
such a taboo topic that they become unaware. And so the the broad statistics in the United States, for example, are that one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. And this is based on reported abuse. So we are not even factoring in the cases that are not reported. And just from the data that's been collected and the studies that have been done, that is a huge number because the understanding is that 60% of children who are abused never tell uh, anyone until they're either adults or they don't disclose at all. So if you think about a classroom of 20 kids, we're talking about four to six children in that class that are being abused. So that's, you know, that's a, a, a pretty high number, again, considering that these are just the numbers that are being reported. So it is very prevalent. Everyone who's listening right now probably knows someone who has been abused and that person may or may not have ever disclosed. So we're talking about trauma that repeats itself because of the fact that those people are not educating themselves or when they try to educate themselves, they get triggered. They have never developed the skills of boundary setting. And so there is, there's so many layers to how to get started with this. And I think that that's where people get sort of tripped up and lost. It's like, where do I start? How do I teach this? When do I teach it? You know, what's appropriate? What's not appropriate? Um, and so that's why, you know, getting the right education is so key. We need to be better at having our own boundaries first in order to teach it. And then having that information to teach others why these boundaries are so important when we're asking grandparents, for example, like, we're not going to force our child to hug or kiss anyone because we want them to learn how to set their boundaries. And a grandparent may not understand or think that you're overreacting. And then knowing, here's the facts, here are the statistics, here is why it's so important for us to teach our kids about body autonomy and rights. And I think actually one of your questions was, um, you know, what, like, how do kids start to really learn this is by learning about the uh, the rights that they have and how to use their voice and that their voice matters. And, and, you know, there's a series of things, but if you start with those fundamental pieces around consent, which, you know, the, the foundation is body rights and boundaries, um, you know, you're off to at least a good start with abuse prevention. I think I threw so many questions at you because I'm just like, I don't, I have so many of them, but I, th I think another one was how does it start? What are typically the signs or the like things that predators use? And I know, which was scary. And I think I read this reading through your material that often it's someone that the kid knows, or it can be family members and that's terrifying. So how does that even start? That's a great, great question also. Yeah, so the statistics again, 90% of abuse happens at the hands of people that you and your child know and trust. So typically that is anyone who is, uh, you know, regularly interacting with your child, whether that's a teacher, a coach, babysitter, daycare, staff, um, even family members, right? And, and of that 90%, 40% are family members. So that's a high number as well. And this idea of stranger danger is just not accurate. It's only 10% of abuse happens by strangers. So what, is, what does that mean in terms of like who your children interact with? Predators are very calculated in the strategies that they use to access children. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about with that is there are communities online of predators who in, engage, interact with each other to exchange uh, child sexual abuse material, which was formerly known as child pornography. And they have these communities in on the dark web where they exchange information as well about how to successfully abuse children and get away with it. There are predator manuals. And, and I don't make this up. You can go onto a website called childrescuecoalition.org. It's a nonprofit organization and they uh, basically hunt down online predators and have accessed these manuals, right? And unfortunately, these manuals aren't even illegal because they don't contain images or videos. So they have to pass laws in order to make these illegal. But there are manuals that are educating predators on how to access children, how to groom families, right? And so that was to your to your question. My point is that 
grooming, which is the strategies that predators use, again, they can be family members, they can be people that you know, they are learning how to gain the trust uh, and develop relationships with children that seem very innocent, that seem like, you know, oh, this is a caring adult, a caring person who wants to help our family or wants to be extra helpful with our child. You know, it can take months, it can take, you know, years even for a, a predator to groom a family. And what they're looking for, to answer your question very specifically, what they're looking for are families that are not educated, that are not boundary setting families, right? So they don't have rules around uh, you know, touch, they don't have rules around secrets. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I teach is that we need to, number one, learn about what those red flags are of what predators do. So how do they start to, you know, develop access to kids? Um, how do they groom families, right? And once you know those, then you can start to spot them and pick up on those red flags and teach kids about listening to their body. If something makes them feel uncomfortable, teach them how to set boundaries and say, I don't like that. That doesn't feel okay. Please stop. We don't keep secrets in our home. We have a family safety secrets rule. Giving your kids that language so that that becomes the red flag to the predator to say, oh, you know, this is this is not an easy target because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for, you know, if I do something, will the mom say say anything? Right. If if the mom is permissive or the parent doesn't really notice, they're going to you know take the next step. They will ask a child to keep a, an, a very innocent secret and see if the child will keep it as a test to say, OK, this is a child who is, you know, the family hasn't taught them not to keep secrets. So they're looking for specific signs of a family that is not act, you know, proactively teaching their kids about abuse prevention, and those become the easier targets. So this is why it's so key to give our kids the language and the skills to raise the red flags against the predators and be able to become less of a target. It blows my mind that there are that many people who can be so calculated and almost like it's a profession. And maybe that's because I was blessed enough to not have to see people doing things like that, but it just blows my mind. So like, so even like parents, does it mean that all people that are abusers, you know, are in those kinds of communities or like, I'm just trying to understand the psyche behind someone who would do something like that. Cause I just can't under understand why. Yeah. So unfortunately, a big part of the issue is the type of pornography that is becoming more and more mainstream, which is younger and younger youth involved in this kind of pornography. But then there's also, of course, um, people who are perpetuating abuse because they're filming it. They are putting it on the dark web and normalizing right? They're basically normalizing this kind of abuse and justifying it. So a lot of times, you you know, if you see, for example, one of the manuals that was confiscated, um, the manual is called Child Love. You know, these communities have basically sprouted to normalize abuse within each other. And that doesn't mean that every predator or every pedophile um, or child abuser is in these communities. But we, we do know that because of the internet, it has exploded. And there's also a profitability factor. So there is the selling of content that has become another way for people, particularly through this pandemic, to make money. And it's, you know, part of child sex trafficking. A lot of people don't realize that whenever there is an exchange of money of physical material that's, you know, photos or videos, that now becomes child trafficking. So that is another thing that drives this engine. And because parents are unaware and they're not maybe teaching also online safety to really young kids because they think, oh, you know, there's, they're not going to be online with anybody dangerous. They're only talking to, you know, their friends, you know, because even peers have, you know, started becoming a problem um, with this. So there's a lot of parts to it, but ultimately it comes down to the fact that we are over sexualizing kids, both in media as well as through uh, pornography, and kids are just not being educated enough about it. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot for predators to have access to because parents aren't being as proactive as they could be. It's very powerful that you said they're normalizing it. And I never thought of it that way. And you're absolutely right. 
the internet was created when I was a kid. And I feel like even when it was really new and I remember going on and at the time forums were the thing before Facebook, like you would go to like forums to talk about your favorite band or whatever. And I remember certain times where like things would pop up on accident and I would feel like, oh my gosh, I should have seen that. Or like in forums, conversations I would accidentally stumble upon would be very inappropriate for a kid to read. And I always used to feel like something was wrong with me. Like I'm dirty or like I'm a bad person because I saw these things. And my parents at the time had no idea because the internet was so new. But now like with my younger sibling, who's like 12 years younger than I am, you know, they have blockers and like ratings, all these things that didn't exist back then. But I know even still with those like programs, you can come across things that aren't helpful, but I'm so grateful that there are these tools and like, we're actually able to prevent this now for kids. And it's not about you as a person. It's about those people who take advantage and teaching how to make those boundaries. And now we can be proactive just makes me feel so excited. I think another reason this topic is, you know, so interesting too, is because it ties to our spiritual health. I just think that people who are abused or have these experiences happen, like it can dim your light. It can make you feel shut off. If it, it can cut off that flow of like unwavering love. And so I'm hoping that someone listening to this right now can, can get something from it and start to feel more whole again and feel more hope if anything. And so I really appreciate you sharing what you have. I know earlier we talked about that people with a history of abuse tend to be high achievers. So can you talk to me about that a little bit? What a lot of people tend to think when they think of someone who's a survivor or who has experienced um, any kind of complex trauma is that they are not able to function as anyone else would, right? And that they there's a, a brokenness in a sense, right? And while that may very well be true, there is a capacity to be able to achieve uh, on on a larger scale. And it's almost like um, your personality or your mind sort of splits in two. And there's one, you know, aspect of you that is trying to cope with the trauma and deal with the emotional aspect of it. And there's the other half that really takes on this other personality of trying to achieve uh, in order to compensate for the low self-worth that the other half of you may be trying to cope with and deal with. And you can look at many examples of survivors who are extreme high achievers. One, uh, an older sort of case that I learned about and helped me understand this concept was, and I can't remember her last name now, but she was Miss America. She went on to do amazing things. Like she achieved so much in her lifetime, but was someone who had been abused from the time she was five to when she was 18 by her father. And she basically developed these two personalities of, you know, being able to cope. And so a lot of, uh, you know, when you start to look at that research and look at the cases, you know, that, that you can point to, to say, you know, this, this is happening very, very regularly, uh, you can start to see that there is this pattern of wanting to become good enough. And that in itself actually stems from this idea of if something like that happened to you, then you are worth less because of purity culture. And a lot of people don't really connect those dots initially. I actually have a TEDx talk that I'm going to be doing this year talking about dismantling this really antiquated patriarchal construct called the Madonna whore complex. And really it tells you, you know, if you are virginal and pure and, you know, therefore you are good, but if you are sexual or have, you know, done that pre-marriage um, or have any kind of sexual desire, then you are less than, and you're considered, you know, exploited, you know, word here, but a lot of that is a, this cultural understanding of, you know, if something like this happened to you, then you are dirty, you are less than, you are X, Y, Z. And for survivors, because of the shame that's attached to it, there's this whole sense of, you know, I need to do these things in order to earn that worth, which is actually already inherently you. You are worthy without needing to do any of those things. Uh, but we, you know, feel that we need to do those things in order to 
be worthy of love, be worthy of affection, be worthy of connection. Um, and so you find a lot of these high achievers actually have a lot of trauma around sexuality, whether that happened in childhood or in their youth or in adulthood, you know, rape survivors, or anyone who has had, uh, you know, sex trafficking survivors, they will have very low self-worth because of that tie uh, culturally. And then will, you know, try to compensate and it's detrimental to your mental health because you tend to burn out. You tend to just live very unhealthy ways uh, of coping with that, you know, stress of overachieving without really having a good balance. I think it's great to achieve and to seek out and go after your goals, but you need to do it in a way that is good for the whole self, not just for this one part that is trying to attain validation really, you know, is what it, it comes down to. So that's something that I think a lot of survivors don't realize initially. And when it's pointed out, they realize like how much healing needs to be done and that they don't have to push so hard to achieve those things, you know, against their own health. Do you struggle with time management and feel overwhelmed by everything you have to get done? And have you tried sticking to a regular schedule but get pulled every which way by shiny objects and demands from others? If you want to simplify your life and get better at being decisive, finally getting productivity down in your life, then this message is for you. I have released a new book called How to Not Lose Your Shit, the ultimate productivity guide for entrepreneurs. This book gives all the methods that I have taught my private clients, my followers for many years on how to see results in your business and to get more peace in your life. I've had so many entrepreneurs say how overwhelmed they feel and drained and burned out. And so I teach them a framework and different techniques that help them to take back their peace and to start loving running their business again and to start feeling human again. If any of this sounds like you and any of it sounds good to you, then make sure you buy this book now. It is workbook style, so it's a roadmap and it gives you a link as well to a download that you can easily print and use as you're implementing everything in the book. And it's very short. It's probably like 60 to 70 pages. So it's very short because I only wanted to give you information that was actually useful to you. And I throw in a few stories as well from people that I've worked with. So a lot of good things in there. Make sure you buy it now if this sounds like something you need. And if you have any questions, feel free to direct message me or email me. And I hope it helps. I guess I want to go back to the concept of purity. And as someone who was raised in the Catholic church, went to Catholic school, I'm still a Christian and I, I go to a different Christian church, but I definitely did have a warped sense and guilt for sexual feelings for sex in general. You know, when I was a kid, if a boy hugged me, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something wrong. Like it was that bad because they drill it in you. At least my experience, it might not be everyone's experience, but in my experience, they drill that worthiness that it's tied to sex. So what is shame-free sex positivity? Because I know that is something you talk about. And for adults who struggle with that narrative, like maybe they struggle with that purity complex. Maybe they feel unworthy because of everything. So how can we change that narrative and start to reclaim that part of us? So I grew up in a sex negative home. I was raised Catholic, very strict. We didn't talk about sex at home. It was a dirty word. And I had a lot of shame around my own desires when I was growing up as a teenager and really trying to grapple with what does it mean that I, you know, feel these things or, you know, whatever it was, right? And particularly um, with school also being very abstinence-based and fear-based. So I didn't, you know, I was learning from the media. I was learning from like HBO Real Sex and like trying to get my hands on whatever information I could. And unfortunately, it led me to making a lot of unsafe decisions in my sexual health and sexual life. That's one of the reasons why I always say that I'm a sexual literacy advocate, because I think the more education and information that we have as adults and that we can share with our children in age-appropriate ways, the safer 
of a sexual health and sexual life that they will have. So for me, abuse prevention and sexual health education go hand in hand. For adults who feel shame tied to those things, you know, it took me a very long time. Again, having a supportive partner, a sexual partner is very helpful. So it's important to try to be open and have those open conversations. But that, you know, just saying that it's like, well, I don't feel comfortable even talking about sex, or I might have a lot of shame tied to, you know, my sexuality or the things that happened to me or the things that I like now as a result of it even. And so having those conversations has to start with some, you know, digging um, about where your sexual values came from. And when I teach parents on how to have these conversations with their kids, one of the first things that I tell them is you have to start with looking at what your sexual values are, where they came from, and what do you want them to be now? Do they still make sense to you? Do you reject them, but you don't, you know, you're not sure what is okay? Um, so I always recommend parents to journal, you know, just sit down with yourself and have a real one on one about where did my sexual uh, values and ideas come from? Was it from my peers? Was it from my parents? Was it from church? Uh, what was that messaging that I received? And do I still carry that today? Is it something that has still has a hold on me or have I let go of those things? What am I replacing them with that makes me feel um, you know, whole and complete and feel better about it? And then seek out the information that you need from you know, whether that's um, either going to a sex therapist or seeking out information from, um, you know, like you can go on Instagram and look up sex educator and find an amazing resource of, you know, so many wonderful sex educators that are out now teaching uh, parents how to teach their kids or just to teach themselves. I, I found that there's one uh, account that I follow and is, is a dear friend of mine, uh, Sex Positive Families. Melissa Carnegie is an amazing educator. And on her page, which is specifically for parents to teach their kids about sex ed, there are so many people who are adults or even teenagers that go on to learn from her and say, like, I feel like I'm educating myself for the first time on these topics because I never had access to that in real ways. I mean, today... Unfortunately, a lot of youth, particularly teenagers between the ages of 14 and 18 years old, say that pornography is their source of sex education. And that in part is because parents aren't having these conversations at home because they don't know how to have them. And they, they're not comfortable being able to say the words themselves because they didn't grow up in a home where that was normal. So it starts with doing some reflection. I always recommend journaling. And then looking at what is it that I want to replace that with? And what are the values that I have that I want to share with my kids? Um, do I want them to be fearful of having these conversations with me? Or do I want them to feel you know, comfortable and open to come to me? And how will I respond, right? So there's a lot of uh, introspection that I recommend. And then if you feel like you have a lot of trauma around sexuality and wanting to really reclaim it, but not knowing how, this is where, again, I you know recommend that you seek out support from professionals who are trained to be able to help you do that, because you'll be able to start healing that aspect. I think that sexuality is such a powerful force that is part of our humanity that we need to reclaim. And it actually gives you so much more power in all other areas of your life. When you reclaim your sexuality, um, it's almost like reclaiming a part of yourself that you had pushed away and you can now welcome back in and integrate into your whole self. It's so great. And I actually had a conversation on the podcast with a sexual empowerment coach, Lucy Lampy, and we talked about how creativity is the same energy source as your sexuality. And so when you said that, I just got chills because yeah, if you start integrating it again and embracing it and accepting it, you're right. It will expand and amplify other parts of you. And a thought came to mind as well that, so boundaries obviously are a good thing, but when there's too much boundary or like constriction around it, is that why sex has been perverted and warped as this taboo sexualized thing that we see in the media now because so many people had to get their education from pornography or other things. And like, we never really, like we kind of just sweep it under the rug. Do you think that's why it's perverted the way it has? 
I think it's perverted the way it has because we teach our children a double standard. On one end, we say, don't talk to your kids or, or we say, don't talk about sex. You know, it, it's going to make you want to have sex or, or you know, whatever that that really old way of thinking is. Right. But um, at the same time, media is saturated with it, right? So kids are getting these very mixed messages uh, that makes them almost want to rebel, really. Like parents are saying, don't look at it, don't talk about it, don't think about it. And the media is saying, hey, look at this, check this out, don't you want this? And so kids, as they grow up, which are naturally curious and rightfully so because they're exploring the, the world in its entirety, um, when we say, you know, let's cut this part of your humanity off until you become an adult and then go off and figure it out on your own, especially through those puberty ages and, and the, the development in the teen years, their hormones are racing. They want to understand how to interact in relationships with others. And we are just not giving them any tools to do that. So of course, they're finding the default, which is talking to peers, talking to the internet, getting information from pornography about what sex actually looks like, which is completely erroneous, um, doesn't reflect or represent what sex and intimacy and relationships are actually about. And we end up in relationships where one person is not being respected. It's non-consensual most of the time, or people don't know how to ask for consent. There's this really great book that I've been reading. It's a study that was done at Columbia University with college students to find out what their understanding of consent and sexuality is as they go into relationships. I think it was like 90% of the people that took the survey reported that they really didn't understand consent and they really didn't understand even how to ask for consent or didn't know how to read body language that said this person is not interested. Or if they did understand it, they still felt that they had a right to that interaction because the person came to their room or the you know they bought that person dinner so therefore they felt that they had a right you know so there's there's so much that's being um, misconstrued and misunderstood and nobody is educating kids because they're afraid that it's going to open pandora's box to kids having sex meanwhile it's happening anyway and unsafely so i think that the 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 problem is that we do come from a very puritanical um, foundation as a culture where we think that talking about sex is sinful and negative. And if we do talk to kids about it, it's going to make them want it more. Um, so we haven't moved away from this really antiquated thinking. And I think that that's what is fueling all of these issues. And until we move away from that and really start educating our youth appropriately, it's not going to change. So I think that, you know, it, again, it comes back to education and being transparent with our youth about really what's going on and how to be safe. This made me think of growing up in, in an Italian family and how alcohol, wine, beer, it was at dinner, um, you know, no one was getting wasted, but people, you know, my family would enjoy wine at Christmas or like at dinner and like people would have fun. And I remember in high school, in college, I didn't really like, I didn't get why people were obsessed with it. I'm like, why are you so obsessed with getting drunk and drinking so much alcohol? And I realized it's because my parents normalized that it was there they obviously were like, okay, well, don't drink and harm yourself. Like they actively told me, take care of yourself, be cautious about, you know, if you try it, how much you do, like all these things. And so I never was the person that felt like I had to make it a lifestyle ever. And so I wonder if it's the same thing. Like if you talk about sex to your kids or your partner or your family, and it becomes this like part of life and we talk about it, there's nothing, there's no shame behind it. Then maybe there wouldn't be this like urgency to look at all of these weird sources to figure out about it. And you're like, okay, cool. And then you're more like empowered, like you said earlier, to make the choice and to understand what your boundaries are and to own them and claim them. 
I think absolutely. I mean, it, you can look at it with anything, really. It's you, you can look at it with food. If we teach our children about healthy eating habits versus just saying like, you know, I think people tend to think, well, if I give my kid access to the pantry, then they're going to eat all the junk food. And while that may be true, we can still give them access to the pantry and point out what's healthy versus unhealthy. Why is this a better choice than that being a better choice? You know, we it's it's really just about education. And I think a lot of that has to do with almost this power trip that if we don't control what our kids do, then they're going to go do something bad. But we ultimately are just not giving them any skills, you know, and, and that's what happened with me. I, you know, I always refer back to myself, even um, my mom, just because we didn't talk about sex and we didn't talk about boundaries or consent. Um, and she really was very strict with our social life. So I didn't get to go to sleepovers. I really didn't get to go to parties. I was the one that was like, you have to be home at nine when everybody was allowed to be home at 11. Like there were all of these restrictions so that once I was able to go off and do those things, um, you know, I went off to university. I was doing everything that I wasn't allowed to do, but didn't have any skills to do them safely. And so that's really what we're setting kids up with when we don't give them sex education, when we're afraid to have those conversations and worse, when we prohibit them. So if you are telling your kids, don't think about sex, don't don't talk about sex. Um, if somebody talks to you about it at school, like, you know, shaming them for even like listening to the conversation we are really just what we're telling them is that we don't accept this conversation in our home. We're not going to talk about it. And when the kids are curious, they're just going to go elsewhere for that information. And it's just always going to be a more dangerous situation. Like, wouldn't you rather your child be able to ask you so that you can direct them in the right way as to how to access the right information or saying, you know, this isn't information that you need to know right now, but we can talk about it later when it's appropriate. Right. Or here's what, you know, all that you need to know. I, a lot of times parents are like, well, what if my child asks me like what 69 is? Cause they heard it on the bus, you know, or they heard it at school. And I say, well, you know, there are very simple ways to explain to them what it is without going into detail, without explaining to them, you know, th that, uh, you know, this is what adults do or blah, blah, blah. Like there are very simple ways that you can do that. So it starts with educating yourself again about how to have those conversations so that you can then. And, and it's OK also to not know. Right. If your child says, like, what is 69? And you're like, you know. Let's talk about that in a little bit. I'm in the middle of cooking, but I will definitely come back and answer that. And then you like go take a breath and figure out what you're going to say and do some research about what you need to like say to them uh, and then come back to the conversation and say, you know, by the way, uh, how come you were asking that? Or by the way, um, you know, where did you hear that? And and just not shaming them, but just keeping the conversation open so that they can safely have that with you and know that you're a safe person to come to and ask those questions. Because the worst thing that you want is them asking the wrong person who's a predator, and that opens the door and the gateway for them to be in an unsafe situation. Well, now I'm curious, how would you explain that to a kid <laughs> without saying literally what it is? Yeah, well, it, it again, it also depends on age, you know, and the first thing that I always say to parents is, ask some follow-up questions before you give your final answer. Um, I did a really funny skit the other day uh, on, on Instagram where the mom and the daughter are in the car and she's like, mom, what's lube? And the mom is like, lube? Like, what do you mean lube? Like, what are you talking about lube? And she's like, oh, it's, it's right there. And it was like lube express for like oil changes or whatever. And the mom's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, okay. You know, so asking a follow-up question instead of diving into like, well, it's this, you know, thing that you use. Um, you know, I always say, ask the question, well, where did you hear that? And how come you're asking that? Who said that? And do you know anything about it? What did you hear? Right. So you want to get some point of reference. 
as to where the question came from, what they already know about it. And again, depending on your child's age, you can explain it very simply. Well, that's something that adults do with each other's bodies. Um, it's, you know, something that uh, you like because different people can have sex in different ways. And again, this depends if you've already explained the concept of sex. Maybe if you haven't, then you can just say, you know, it's it's a physical act that two people do uh, when they're in a sexual relationship and leave it at that. And then if they ask questions, then you can, you know, decide how much more you want to share. They may say, oh, okay. And like walk off. And it's like not a big deal because they weren't really that interested. A lot of times we tend to like have a lot more charge to a question than they will. Um, I, my husband is, is very funny about this because, you know, he wants to be super sex positive because that's how he grew up. And so he's very open and comfortable with, you know, answering questions. And sometimes he'll want to share more than the kid is even interested in hearing. And like, they've already tuned out and he's like, but you know, the ovaries and blah, 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 blah. And, and they're like, okay, I'm like, I'm playing a game, dad, you know, like, <laughs> I'm not, like, I didn't need to know that much. So we just need to, um, you know, have some key phrases of asking some questions, finding out what it is that they really want to know. And then giving them just the basics and determining based on that if they have more questions or if that you know that was enough that satisfied them. So basically, what you're saying is it's probably not as scary as you crack it up to be. Yeah, I can't even imagine if it's like, oh, what's lube? It's like, oh, okay, I actually didn't have to go there. So that that's awesome. That's hilarious. No, I love that advice. It's such great advice that it it's probably not as scary as you think. And then. You, you're right. Like kids, their point of reference is so different from ours. So they're probably not even like going the layers beneath the surface that where we've gone or we're going. And so, oh, that's so great. Okay. So I know you mentioned something that you were reading earlier, but I would like to know either books that you're reading now or books you would recommend for someone that's listening to this conversation is like, I want to dive in and you know, learn about this. So whatever comes to mind. There's a really great one. It's actually by Melissa Carnegie called Sex Positive Talks. Um, and that one really gives you a breakdown of what to teach at different ages. So if you're just getting started on that journey, that's a really great one. Um, another really important one is also called Sexploitation. The other ones that I'm reading, I don't know necessarily that your audience will want to listen to, but there's one that's called Conversations with a Pedophile, which is a psychologist who basically interviews this um inmate who she was charged with uh, doing therapy with and uh, it's sort of this 10 year conversation that she had to learn as much as she could about uh, what makes them tick and and what strategies he used um, because he had ended up luring like over 200 children. And so that one is more for me research based to get an understanding. But it's it was actually a book that was created for parents so that they could educate themselves on, you know, what to look for in terms of red flags and things like that. So that's another uh, another one that I'm reading. So I tend to read a lot of heavy, you know, topic books. And that's, you know, just part of what really helps me to stay ahead of the curve in terms of how to teach parents really effectively. Yeah, that actually does sound like a really interesting book because I've seen a lot of like documentaries and docu-series going behind the psyches of people like that. But yeah, I think it is very fascinating to understand that. And it sounds like a good book. Everything you mentioned, we'll make sure we link in the show notes. So if you're listening, it'll be really easy to get those resources. But most importantly, where can we find you? Sure. So you can find me at consentparenting.com. Also on Instagram and Facebook, it's Consent Parenting. And I particularly hang out on, on Instagram quite a bit. So that's where I'm at. Um, but I also do hang out on Clubhouse now as well. And usually have, uh, you know, once once or twice a week, I will pop in to do a room either uh, with someone or just go in to do Q&As. Great. And we'll make sure all of those are linked as well. Do you want to leave one last thought or if there's one takeaway you hope people take from this conversation? I think the biggest takeaway is that these conversations do not have to be scary. They can actually be very empowering because it all comes down to body rights and educating kids on their body rights. So it's really not a conversation about abuse. It's actually a conversation about empowerment. So I hope that 
when people think about these talks that they need to have with their kids, they step into them from a place of wanting to teach their kids about their rights. Thank you so much for the time that you took and the energy that you gave us. I really appreciate your knowledge and your wisdom and your energy. And this was so amazing. And I am absolutely leaving this conversation inspired and, you know, feeling more empowered myself. So thank you so much. Awesome. You're so welcome. Thanks again for having me. Now it's time for an affirmation. I am empowered to create and set boundaries with full love and total ease. If you found today's tips inspiring or thought-provoking, share it right now on social media and make sure to tag me at Francesca A. Phillips or at Find Your Good Space and also weigh in in the comment section at findyourgoodspace.com. You can find links in the show notes. And if you have a spiritual or mindfulness problem that you want me to unpack on an upcoming The Good Space episode or an awesome manifesting story you want to share, give my podcast phone line a ring right now at 917-719-0867. Also, don't forget to download my free morning routine guide. It's what helped me reduce my anxiety, increase productivity, and so much more. The link to everything I mentioned is in the show notes. See you soon.